Natasha Levy. Wow, I enjoyed talking. I enjoyed talking to Natasha. She's originally from Russia. She uh, is a food blogger. She moved out uh, of Russia when she was 20, uh, and she visited many, many countries. She now lives in Hungary. She's very, uh, she's right on the, the, the doorstep there of, of the uh, a war that's happening with Russia and Ukraine. Uh, she talks about that a lot. She talks, uh, she has a child now, a one-year-old. She started this food blog two years ago. Wonderful, wonderful recipes with, with a, you know, a slant of, you know, kind of Eastern Europe. Uh, you know, I have my Italian background with my father, so she's got a bolognese and it didn't have any, have any sugar in it. We talk about that and what she does in these recipes, but all with this kind of backdrop of, of, um, of Russia and, and Ukraine and uh, what she has going on there. Uh, it's a fascinating take. When I ask her about discipline, something happened to her so profound at the age of 14 that that just completely turned her around. Uh, she was reading The Seven Habits of Successful People, and uh, it, it's a wonderful story. Uh, we get into some of the recipes. We get into what's happening there as well. Uh, her, When you hear, when I ask her what motivates her, uh, she talks about the food blog, and then she talks about some other things as well that are just really, really inside and really, uh, really deep. Uh, I really enjoyed my my conversation with Natasha, and I know you will as well. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Joey Pins. People ask me, how did I lose 130 pounds? The quick answer is always discipline. I started my business, wasn't paying attention to my health, was eating too much, you know, drinking too much sweets. My daughter was born. The next thing I know, I'm pre-diabetic, I have hypertension. I knew something had to change. Discipline. I, like many of you, have faced many challenges in your career, in your family, in your life, in your faith. How did you attack them? How did you approach them? How did you solve them, hopefully? It all had to have some degree of discipline. I'm also asked, how did you found and start a tech business that lasted over 25 years? Discipline. I was committed to it, enjoyed technology, didn't enjoy some aspects of it, but knew it was necessary. Discipline. Our podcast mission, how do we use discipline to better ourselves and society? Join me, please, as I talk to interesting people and discuss how they use discipline in their family and their passion and their careers and how it helped them. Our podcast vision, growth through learning from others. Joey Pins Discipline Conversations. It will be light and serious. Join us, please. Thank you for consideration. Natasha Levy, thank you so much for your time. Very excited to talk to you. As a food blogger, how do you eat, create, and inspire? Well, that's a good question <laughs> as a food blogger. Well, I guess it always <clears throat> comes down to what, why are you doing your food blogging? Like if you're a food blogger, you know, what is motivating you to uh, create? Because, for example, if you really like sharing recipes and if you are a good cook and you want to share your creations with the world, that's one thing. Then probably your motivation is coming from your workplace or from your kitchen and you just want to share with, with the world what you have and maybe you're not so uh, keen on uh, technical you know details behind the food blogging but for me personally I when I started food blogging I wasn't so much into cooking which is which is weird because if you start a food blog you you want if you start any kind of blog you want to have expertise in that but when I started I was um, really inspired to learn uh, cooking and I was inspired by other bloggers who were doing a lot of uh, wonderful recipes and posts about how to create a home, how to raise children, how to um, <clears throat> make your surroundings better. And I guess I wanted a part of that in my life. And by learning all those details, I um, started a blog as it helps me to learn as I'm also sharing about my experience with other people. And I think I've learned so much about cooking in the last couple of years that I probably wouldn't have learned so much if I was just cooking for myself or for my family to kind of, you know, to survive <laughs> or to just have mm. food. 
because every week you have to come up with new recipes. You have to have at least two. And so in, in order to do the, that, you have to try a lot of new things. You have to, you know, come up with ideas, develop recipes. And basically every single week you are making something new. And that really encourages um, developing new skills. Yeah, and before we get into the recipes, which I'm very, very excited to do, uh, some of your background, I believe Russian-born, but a lot of time in, in the Ukraine. But um, what really made a big change that you write about is that in Hungary, in the dormitories, meeting with American students. Mm -hmm. uh, and what was well, the change there? Um, in Hungary, in the dormitory, meeting with American students. Well, I think the change in my life happened more so in Russia when I met American people in Russia. Uh, they would come for short missions trips and they. Um, I was helping as a translator, although I didn't speak English that well at that time, but I was kind of assigned to help them as a translator. And it was funny because, you know, a lot of body language <laughs> was involved in that translation. And um, I think I was inspired by how different those people were I think cultures are different. Like American culture is mm. so different from Russian culture. And somehow I was very attracted by uh, the way those specific people, you know, from that specific subculture in America, I guess, were. They seemed to be happy and they seemed to be more joyful. And, and, and it just seemed to me that there is something more in the world that I don't know. You know, I think our culture in Russia is very... A bit, like, depressed, I would say. I think the whole country... is has some some layer of depression and domestic violence is very common alcoholism is very common i know that it's not uncommon in other parts of the world but in russia it is um it's prevailing it's it's big and i mm. think seeing people who are very different in their core the way how they interact with each other with others helped me to believe and hope that there is more to life and i and that's when i left russia at around 20 i went to hungary and I was studying in a um, Christian Bible college and it was in Hungary, but it was founded by an American organization and most people were Americans. And there my life uh, started changing little by little because I was immersed into a different culture uh, with different people. And I learned so much about how to be, how to um, <clears throat> behave with people. And also a lot comes from my background when I was, you know, little, my parents um, my dad was very abusive and my mom was absent most of the time emotionally and physically too. We were at home a lot by ourselves. And so I didn't really learn how to function in society well. And when I was immersed mm. and thrown into that um, life with a hundred other people every day, every second of every day, I was surrounded by people. I think that forced me to get out of my comfort zone and learn a lot about um, boundaries, how to make friends. Um, how to talk to people and, and things like that, how to live together. Mm. What what should Americans know about the, 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 you kind of painted a little bit of a picture there, but uh, what should Americans know about Russian people and the Russian culture? Well, it depends, again, um, why you want to know something. For example, if you're moving mm. to Russia, that's one thing. If you have Russian friends in America, that's another thing. If you're mm. adopting kids from Russia, that's a whole third, you know, mm. um, com kind of set of issues that you would have to deal with. So, for example, if you were to uh, visit Russia, then you probably wouldn't have very many problems. Not right now. Right now, you probably wouldn't be able to visit. But before the whole war happened with Ukraine, uh, Americans were very welcome in Russia. People like foreigners. People are happy. They are, they treat foreigners better. As an American, you'd probably um, be treated better than if you moved to Russia. Mm. If you moved to Russia, then at first people would be very excited about you, helping you in everything. But after some time, this newness would wear off a little bit. Hmm. And then you would find yourself in a situation where people got bored a little bit of you. Then you don't speak the language very well. And people see you rather as an inconvenience because you don't hmm. communicate very well. You don't understand the culture as, as well. You can't be as effective at work or in other areas. And so then um, you see more of this real Russian culture where people are less mm, open to each other, you know, 
I, I was surprised. I wasn't. I did visit California once, and I was surprised how friendly people were to each other, even when they didn't know each other. Like at a, the grocery hmm. store, um, that people can talk, have small talk. You know, that's that's I guess a right. big thing that you guys have that we don't is like small talk. Um, it, it, and I found it encouraging because, you know, you just see somebody being kind to you. I think it makes your day better. <laughs> mm. You know, my father is uh, from Italy, he's Italian, and I spend a lot of time in Italy. And Italians make small talk. They're they're kind, they're friendly, and it's. Uh, I, I've never been to Hungary, but I wonder. I mean, that's it's not that far from, you know, from Eastern Europe uh, and, and Russia. I, I, it's just the it's a pure culture thing, is what you're telling me, Natasha. <sighs> yeah, you know, actually, Russian culture is different from the cultures around that country because we as Russians we don't travel so much we're we're closed mm. in our own world one reason is that it's really hard to get out um, because you have to get all kinds of visas and documents um, and you have to you know you have to pay for all the visas for all the extra documents for all the visits to mm. the these offices and um, Europe European people can travel within Europe easily they don't need any paper any paperwork to in order for a European person to travel to even the, to the States, all they need to do is fill out an online form and then be approved and then go, you know, well, we're in Russia. It's hard. And it's also more expensive mm. for us. Our, I guess our economy compared to other countries is not as good. Um, I, I think even Europe is more expensive than Russia. So for, for Russians, mm. like we travel, but we travel to countries that don't require a visa. So let's say uh, we go to Turkey, to we'll go to Egypt. Um, maybe some people travel to Greece sometimes. I heard, you know, a lot of friends would visit those countries. But if you go to Europe, like that's something cool. Wow, you're, you're traveling to Europe. You know, you have to do so much paperwork for that. And America is so far away from us. So you can imagine how much the plane tickets would cost. <laughs> Hmm. And in your in your twenty, you know, you said you left when you're twenty. When you were twenty and less, a, a child, I'm going to say, were you exposed to cooking? Where did where did this drive for cooking come from? I was exposed to cooking, I guess, but I was I didn't like cooking so much. I felt that cooking is a waste of time, a waste of life, because I mm. live by myself. And so I thought, well, I have this hour and I can read something, go out, you know, meet with friends or I can cook something. And I felt like just cooking something for myself doesn't make very much sense to me. Hmm. Um, then I was I, I, I was traveling a lot from 20 to 25. I barely stayed anywhere for a long, very long time. And I survived with bare, bare minimum. I didn't like... Um, making any special meals but later when i got married at 26 that's when i started exploring more of the cooking world i think what happened is i when i got pregnant i was so sick that i would just stay in bed um sometimes for half a day and out of boredom mm. i would just look at videos of food at cooking videos i really like this youtube channel called epicurious they have so many fun <clears throat> They have these uh, shows where they'll have a beginner cook, then a medium a home cook, and then a chef make the same meal. And, and it's so fun to watch, you know, how different people will make the same thing with different skills. And because mm. I was very sick, I couldn't eat anything, but I was very hungry, you know, pregnant. I, I really liked watching food because <laughs> I couldn't have it. Um, and from there, I started experimenting because I got so many cool ideas, you know, from YouTube videos. So I started experimenting a lot and I tried sourdough. I guess I also came across sourdough videos. Um, but that didn't turn out well for me at first. T sourdough didn't treat me well <laughs> at all. But then my husband is celiac, so he only can have gluten-free stuff. And I did try gluten-free sourdough as well. And that was even worse. It, w it came out hard as a rock and I couldn't even cut into it and it was it was bad it didn't rise it was it was really bad but interestingly now one of my bigger bigger um one of the bigger parts of my website is gluten-free sourdough recipes because yeah. 
with time, I tried, you know, I like to ch- I liked to change recipes because I thought, oh, this is unnecessary. Like, for example, I don't know if you know what is a Dutch oven. Um, yeah. So good, the sourdough bread is baked in a Dutch oven. And um, at first I thought, yeah, who needs a Dutch oven? Like, you don't need a Dutch oven. So I would just make it in a regular, on a regular baking sheet. And then um, I felt like, oh, this dough is a little bit too wet. So I'd add extra flour. Then I'd bake it at a different temperature and think, that's just fine but i changed you know the main the main points of the recipe i basically changed and now i was surprised why my bread was hard as a rock <laughs> i guess just with time when i learned to really follow the recipes as they are i was surprised how much better you know the results were yeah and, and i started a food blog because um i just wanted to have a creative outlet i guess and i was inspired by bloggers online that were creating recipes and not only recipes i really was inspired by people who were creating homes i think that was my like lifestyle blogs i guess that's what you call them Hmm. but when i started i realized to have a lifestyle blog you have to spend a lot of time on it and you have to you know post about gardening and um, design and all kinds of things and that is a lot of time and I realized that to do something well, I need to focus on one thing. And I sticked with recipes. And now I'm I'm doing only that. It's amazing to me that uh, as a child going into the dormitories in Hungary, uh, the only time, the, the real passion that grew for cooking for you was during your downtime when you were pregnant. That's when it really, it was the turning point for you. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I guess having a family changes your mind about cooking because Mm. when I make something and then another person enjoys it, it brings me so much more satisfaction than when I make something for myself and I eat it and then, you know, well, I enjoyed it, but did it really mean so much to me that I would spend two hours making this? Or I could just visit my mom, you know, and she would make (laughs) just as well of a meal and we can enjoy it together. (laughs) When we first got on before we recorded, you mentioned that you were just you weren't feeling that well today, and I said, uh, you know, perhaps have some of that borscht. Now I've never had borscht before; it looks wonderful on your site. You you take great photos, by the way. Are you doing those photos on your on the site? Yeah, I am. Uh, the photographs that, are tremendous. Thank you. I don't think they're that great compared to all the other bloggers that I see out there, but thank you. That is a nice compliment. I, Oh, uh, they they make me hungry. So, what's the difference between Russian and Ukrainian borscht? Well, I think originally borscht came from Ukraine, and I don't think there's really much difference. Every country has their own version. Maybe even mm. maybe just Slovak countries have their own version of borscht, and it is traditionally basically what makes borscht a borscht is you know the combination of sour and sweet and salty in one so you add sugar to the soup you add mm, apple cider vinegar and you add sour cream and then you add of course salt and all kinds of spices so that makes the soup special and it's red like from uh beets very red yeah from beets so that is basically what makes it special some people will make it i guess more on the sour side um some people will will add other vegetables but i don't think there is uh, any significant differences actually you know when i posted my ukrainian borscht on um, the website at first i called it russian borscht just because i'm from russia originally and that's where i um i i thought it was from because that's where i grew up but then i started getting comments i guess you know, with this whole conflict, political conflict, people even more eager mm. to point out, you know, the differences between Russia and Ukraine. And they would comment on the post saying, well, it is Ukrainian and it is not Russian. And I, I had to go a bit deeper into the roots of the dish and then the research on the internet a little bit and change my post from Russian borscht to Ukrainian because way too many people were getting irritated that I would claim that it's Russian. Mm. And it is came from Ukraine. So I decided that I don't want tension. I'll just say it's Ukrainian. <laughs> Interesting. Is it is it served cold sometimes? No, we have a different kind of soup that is served cold, but not this one. I, I don't know if I had it, but I thought perhaps I had it when it was served cold. Maybe I'm thinking of gazpacho or something. But when I saw the picture, uh, 
They look delicious. And uh, it's a lot of work to get those beets um, prepared, though, correct? No, it's not a lot of work. All you need is a good really? grater. Yeah, you, you uh, just grate the beets. And if you have muscle in your hands, it's very quickly it, it's very quickly done. And then all you need to do is uh, fry them on a pan with grated um, carrots. And you add a little bit of tomato paste, a little bit of apple cider, apple cider vinegar, sugar, and fry it separately from the rest. So it's not that hard, actually. Mm. It, it seems hard. I, I was intimidated by borscht myself because I thought it was very hard, but it is actually not that hard. If you make it a couple times, then you get a hang of it. <laughs> you know, here in the States, whenever we're sick, we people want chicken soup. Uh, so would that be the equivalent of, you know, getting sick there when having borscht? Mm, no, I think chicken soup is also a good option here, probably. Mm. Yeah. I actually had some leftover chicken soup that my husband's mom left for us the other day. So that came in handy <laughs> for being sick. Mm. We make borscht, but it's not so, so common that we always have some in the fridge, I guess. I it's more maybe common in Ukraine, not so much here or in Russia either. Mm. You mentioned sourdough before, and... Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've never made it. I've made some simple bread before just with a couple of ingredients and, you know, put the yeast in. And and so how do you, I saw you had the jars and see it bubbling in your, on your, on your site. It looks tremendous. And on your Instagram, uh, tell us the process of making sourdough and how you do it, please. Mm -hmm. All right. So sourdough is basically a bread that is made with yeast that is not commercial yeast. Commercial yeast is something that came out not so long ago, it, probably long enough for us to not remember, you know, that sometimes, some time ago it didn't exist, but people created commercial yeast for us to make bread quickly. You know, within an hour it's ready or a couple hours and we have a loaf of bread. Before that wasn't the case. You had to grow your own yeast. And yeast is basically bacteria that is naturally found in water and flour that is allowed to grow. And what to create a sourdough starter, a sourdough starter is the yeast that you use to leaven the bread. So to create a starter, all you need is to take some flour and water, mix it, and let it sit. When you start seeing bubbles, that means that bacteria starts working. It starts, you know, um, multiplying. And, and those bubbles mean that something is happening. And then as soon as you start seeing bubbles, you can start adding more flour for the yeast because they need to continue feeding on something. And while it is still very little, like let's say you add one tablespoon of um, flour and one tablespoon of water, you mix it. And then you can add, keep adding, you know, one tablespoon of flour, one tablespoon of water. When it starts piling up and your jar is becomes a little bit full, you can start discarding. So that's called sourdough discard. And there are plenty of recipes that use sourdough discard because who wants to throw away flour, especially if it is gluten-free. Gluten-free flour is much more expensive and you don't want to waste it. So there are plenty of recipes that um, designed for you to use that starter discard. Then once your sourdough starter is active, which means that after you fed it, it rises in the jar by, like, it, it doubles or uh, for gluten-free starter, it's enough if it rises by one and a half times. Um, if you're making a regular starter with wheat flour, then it can double or triple in size. It's, it's totally normal. But mm. gluten-free flours are not so friendly with that. Um, and it is a bit harder to get it to work. Although it is possible for a sourdough starter, gluten-free starter, to double. It's not so common. And you can still make good bread even if it doesn't double. And that is something that people sometimes stress over. They think that, oh, my starter is not good because it's not doubling. But for gluten-free, it doesn't necessarily have to double. Um, and when you're making bread, the dough is very sticky. When you're making regular bread that is not gluten-free, that, that is made with wheat, um, the dough is super sticky. And a lot of times what people do wrong is that is they think that they need to add more flour because they can't knead the dough. But that mm. that is going to ruin your bread. You really need to have it so sticky that you can't knead it. That's why there's um, the method of working the dough is by stretching and folding. You stretch the dough and then you fold it onto itself. You stretch it, you fold it onto itself. 
um, every half an hour for, let's say, one and a half or two hours. You do that, and then it works wow. the gluten. And so that's how your bread becomes strong and gluten uh, develops. Then you leave it to rise and you bake. And sourdough is baked at very high temperature. It will be like 420 Fahrenheit. For us, it's 220 Celsius. Now, both gluten-free and regular have to be baked at high uh, temperature. With gluten-free sourdough recipes, I noticed that during the rising stage, the bread or if I make, you know, dinner rolls, cinnamon rolls, they don't rise so much um, outside mm. of the oven. And you think nothing is happening. You might think that um, your recipe failed. Nothing, you know, nothing is nothing changed. But as soon as you put it in the oven, it starts rising and, and, and it really puffs up a lot, especially if you add some steam. So when you make bread to add steam, you basically bake it in a Dutch oven, which is a um, cast iron pot with a lid. For regular bread, it's enough to just bake it in a Dutch oven. For gluten-free, I also add a little bit of ice, uh, a few ice cubes underneath the parchment paper. Um, wow. So that there's extra steam that ra uh, helps the bread rise hmm. even more. And if you're not baking in a Dutch oven, let's say you're making cinnamon rolls or dinner rolls, then you add a dish with water in the bottom of the oven. And then it uh, creates steam that uh, helps your rolls wow. rise. And it also prevents them from browning too quickly because you need to bake them at 220 degrees or 420 Fahrenheit. Then you know, they, they can burn. But to prevent that, you add water and water uh, allows for it to brown slowly. And that's really crucial to making uh, gluten-free things. So yeah, that's, that's sourdough. <laughs> you also talk about one, uh, I forget what it was, but there was one tip when making bread that for gluten-free uh, that kind of binds the bread together. I forget what it was now, but you said a lot uh -huh. of people don't know about it. Um, do you remember it's what that was? Husk. That's Silly what it husk. is, yes. <laughs> yeah. And what do you do with that when you, mm -hmm. when um, you use it? So a lot of people, Silly when they, when they um, make gluten-free bread or gluten-free anything, they use xanthan gum. And xanthan gum is very famous for, you know, being used in gluten-free baked goods. But the problem with xanthan gum is that it keeps the dough together. It keeps it from falling apart completely. But the problem with it is that, let's say you make a loaf of bread. As soon as it's made, it will hold up together very well. But the next day or two days after, your bread will crumble. And um, people hmm. people always ask on Facebook, on, online, on the internet, how can I make bread that doesn't crumble on the next day or in two days? How, do, how can I keep my bread moist and not dry for two, for three days? And normally... Um, you would have to buy store-bought bread. And then at home, always it always turns out crumbly and dry. But there is this new ingredient. I don't know how new is it, but it seems that not so many people are aware of it. It's called psyllium husk. And it transforms um, your gluten-free bread, gluten-free, you know, any, anything you make, gluten-free tortillas. You can make tortillas, um, that will be very flexible. They will hold up. They will stay flexible and moist for a few days and you can hmm. make flatbreads. And that's something that people who are on gluten-free diet, they um, missed a lot. I guess they still miss those who don't use psyllium husk because, you know, you can make tortillas, but they will uh, break as you try to wrap something into them or you can make flatbreads, but they normally, if they're gluten-free, they'll be a bit smaller and they will be thicker and you can't really wrap things into them so much. But if you use psyllium husk, you can make them look and feel the same as um, wheat um, tortillas or wheat flatbreads. Not exactly 100% the same, but it is very close. So psyllium husk is basically, uh, it's like from, I'm not entirely sure, but it's some shells of some seeds that are gathered together and they're very fluffy. And then you... Um, put it in water and it creates a gel. And there are three uh, types of psyllium husk. One is whole husks that are not processed. You need to use more of them 
and it creates a very nice gel. It doesn't clump. And then there is psyllium husk powder. And what people confuse a lot of times is um, coarse, coarse powder and fine powder. There is um, a website called The Loopy Whisk. The lady makes so many great gluten-free recipes and she has a post on psyllium, on psyllium husk. And I noticed that in her post, she just gave two types of psyllium husk and psyllium husk powder that she um, you know, put a picture of on there is not the same as many of us will use. And I saw on, on Facebook, people sometimes ask, why does my psyllium husk powder clump? Why is it not working? It says to put it in water, but then I just have little, you know, clumps that don't even dissolve. And the reason is because there are two types of that kind of powder and the fine powder has to be added directly to dry ingredients. And then you have to let the dough sit for 20 to 40 minutes in order for it to absorb. And Wow. Mm, then your dough will have good elastic structure. That's why people don't recommend using psyllium husk powder. But if you're using the powder that is um, not so finely ground, the kind that the Loopy Whisk, you know, website uh, features, and <clears throat> then then you're fine. It it is even better because you need to use less of it, and um, you need to use less of it. Yeah. And it's cheaper. I don't know. It is cheaper for me. I don't know how it is in America, but it is cheaper here. So I don't see a reason why people would not use psyllium husk powder. Just the only thing is that if they confuse, you know, the two types. But yeah, that is definitely something I was afraid of when I started making gluten-free things because it was a little bit more expensive than xanthan gum. And um, it is a new thing that not so many recipes call for. Most recipes you see online will call for xanthan gum. And but when once I tried, I realized how uh, much better it is, and so I don't don't really use xanthan gum so much anymore on its own, only together with psyllium husks, because together they can create a special texture for certain things, like let's say um, cinnamon rolls need, or uh, I made um, soft pretzels too, or dinner rolls. I use both because it, it helps create this fluffy texture. You know, bread has this. Um, bready texture that is very um, thick and and harder somehow. But when you want something more fluffy, like cinnamon rolls or dinner rolls, you add both xanthan gum and psyllium husk, and then it creates a good texture. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Your passion is uh, is so so cr- so contagious, Natasha. I, I love it. <laughs> and so uh, while well, I was going through your blog, I. You know, I mentioned that my father's Italian, so I I saw your bolognese, and I went uh-huh. to it, and I was so happy that you didn't add sugar. Uh, I see <laughs> so often people adding sugar to bolognese, but you do add celery and carrots to kind of add and kind of cut the kind of cut the probably the 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 sourness, the spice of the um of the tomato. Yeah, and you also think- add milk. Yes, and I did check out a few different recipes before making this one, and there were a few recipes that didn't call for celery and carrots or for milk, but some of them were saying that you absolutely have to add milk because it makes meat so much you know, softer, and adding mm. celery and carrots makes the flavor more deep, and I just decided to try it, and it didn't didn't taste bad so i thought well why not if it is really helping and i so you know in the meatballs a lot of times people will add milk and say that that helps them to stay soft so i thought that if people suggest that maybe it is good (laughs) Mm -hmm. my father is from southern italy so in, in in southern italy there's not much dairy uh, mm-hmm. And they just olive oil instead of dairy. So we don't add any celery and carrots. But in the north, very, very common to add celery and carrots and uh, and and dairy. And uh, they're both just as good. You didn't mention San Marzano tomatoes. What is that? Like a, <laughs> so it's a specific – Oh, well, very good. I'm going to help you now. And uh, look at it. Try to make bolognese with San Marzano. So San Marzano tomato is a specific kind of tomato. In Italy, it's grown a certain way, and it's a specific type, San Marzano. The only way that you know I'll make any bolognese is with San Marzano. If you use San Marzano, it's very hard to um, 
to mess it up. So mm -hmm. let me, uh, I'll, I'll give you some, uh, some, uh, uh, I don't know, some idea to go off and make perhaps mm -hmm. another version. Uh, but it, it, it does look wonderful. And your Carbonara was very good too. It didn't have any cream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it is it originally made without cream. Right. Yeah, we don't have any. And like I said, in, in the South, it's no cream. It's just bacon or pancetta and, of course, the olive oil. And uh, and you're using all gluten-free pasta because of your, your husband with the celiac there. I, I never had it before. Yeah, it is different. And my husband is not a fan of pasta because it is not so good. <laughs> it is very right. sticky. It has so much starch that when you boil it, it sticks together. And at first, when it's fresh... It's possible to still, you know, make it look nice. But as soon as you put it in the fridge, you take it out. It's just one big clump of pasta that you have to cut uh. up, basically. Can't eat it. Yeah, it's not so so good, fortunately. So I don't make those dishes at home very often um, because he doesn't like pasta. But sometimes I do. <laughs> now, when I make pasta, I just use... Well, we use zero, you know, double zero flour, semolina flour, and then water, and then some salt. But it's just the the flour itself that he can't have. Yeah, he can't have right? uh, flour. Yes, exactly. So wheat is basically what people with celiac disease they can't have, and wheat mm. is in flour only. So it's mm. pretty much flour. Some people will say that oats also have gluten, but it's only because the way the oats are processed. But basically, anything that has flour in and Flour is used in many dishes that sometimes we wouldn't think that, you know, it has gluten, but surprisingly, so many things will have gluten, but it is easy to mm. substitute. I actually am sort of working on gluten-free pasta currently. I'm trying to make different pastas on my own that will be a bit, you know, less sticky, but so far all of them had very strange flavor to it, a very strange taste that I didn't necessarily like. And I wonder if it is tapioca flour or if it's brown rice flour. I don't know. It's hard mm. hard to point out, but there's something strange about it. But I, I did get a pasta maker recently to try and make gluten-free pasta. So that's something in the works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because many here, you know, gluten-free is very popular, as you know. And uh, yeah, to try to strike that balance is, uh, uh, is very important. So Natasha, I always... Uh, bring up the point how I started my business in the 90s and I ended up like your business, by the way. I just worked way too hard and I, I gained a lot of weight. I, you know, I wasn't paying attention to myself. I worked long hours. I got up to about 340 pounds. Absolutely terrible. And my doctor said, if I don't lose the weight, I'm not going to see my daughter graduate. And so for the next year and a half, I just ate differently. I just exercised. I, I just focused. And that's all I needed to hear. And people ask me how, and I just say discipline. I just, I lost the weight with discipline. I wonder, given your background and where you are now in your life, how does discipline play a role in your life, Natasha? Discipline plays a huge role in my life. I think uh, when I, it started when I was in ninth grade, I was 14 years old. And I do just moved to a new place, went to a new school. And in the new school, I the teachers didn't know me so well, so they didn't give me good grades just because they know me. And I got mainly, you know, C's for all of my um, subjects. And one time in the class, we were sitting with my friend and I told him, you know, I could be an A student if I wanted to, but I just don't want to. I don't care about it. That's why I get bad grades and he laughed at me and he said yeah no way you would ever be able to be an a student because you know look at your grades uh, you know how much work goes into it and some something hurt my pride in that i think and for the next and we made a bet that in the next two months after two months i will have all of my grades will be a the final grade you know we have um i think we had four parts within that year that would uh, finalize our grades and we would get our final grades for I guess maybe every two months or so and so I decided the next two months I'm going to get all of them um, to be A and I will prove him wrong um, and that was just my pride I guess at 14 years old and I really worked hard mm. and I think that's when I learned the power of discipline I was reading a book at that moment that's called seven habits of highly effective people and it sure. helped me a lot I um cut out all the unnecessary things from my life that I was doing that didn't uh, bring me anything, you know, like watching TV or watching some shows just for no reason. Or, um, And I made a schedule for myself to do homework. I would wake up at six in the morning and um, 
make sure that I'm ready for the next uh, class. And I made it in two months. I had all A's other than for two subjects. There was the same teacher who she just out of principle, she said, you can't go from a C to an A. You have to go to a B first and then you go to an A. And so she didn't give me an A, but all the other teachers did. And I think that's <laughs> when I saw the power of discipline, that what, how much you can do with your life just for two months, just um, living an intentional life. And from then, whenever I had a purpose in my life, I would um, look back on that experience and um, think, what do I need to do in order to achieve, you know, my goal? For example, if we talk about this food blog, you know, I have a one-year-old at home um, and I have a family. So it is not, it doesn't happen on its own to have a food blog. You have to really make a point, mm. make, make effort and you have to make a schedule and you need to be disciplined in order to make it happen. Because if you really want to, um, earn something with your business if it's not just for a hobby you know if you really want to make money with it then you really need to be disciplined and you really need to show up uh, regularly for it and i heard somebody advice that you should at least make it a point to have two hours every single day that you work on your blog um for monday to friday and then if you do that at first then you will get it, you know, get it started. Then later you will see what works better for you. And I've been um, really trying really hard to dedicate at least two hours every day. Sometimes when I can't, I'll do more on another day. Let's say if I didn't do anything today, tomorrow I'll spend three hours and the, next, the day after three hours um, trying to work. And actually, you know, I have probably spend more time than that because I will do two hours of computer time, but then I will also have to test recipes. I have to make recipes. I have to photograph recipes. Mm. That's a whole other set of time that I kind of do during the day because I anyway cook for my family. My baby will crawl around the table where I take pictures. So that happens naturally. It's not so dedicated, um, but I do make a point to have um, two hours of computer time when I'm uploading posts, uh, editing photos. And normally I do it after my baby goes to sleep. Um, but, you know, it also works for everybody different. Some, sometimes people prefer to wake up earlier and some people prefer to stay up later. And um, I think in life, if you want to achieve anything, you really need to be disciplined. And um, hmm. it is impressive, you know, how much you were able to go through, like where you started and where you ended up that you were able to lose so much weight and keep it that way, you know, and be an inspiration to so many people out there that, you know, your health matters and you can do it and things like that. And I think that it's not only helping you, probably not in your health, but it also helps you in everything else in life. Because once you learn how much power discipline has, then you can apply it to everything else in life. Even in relationships, that seems that is something more um, natural, intuitive, you don't have to structure it, but even in relationships, discipline makes such a difference. You know, there are um, so many books on relationships, on love languages and all kinds of things. And in order to make sense of it and to learn to speak the language of the other person, you need to be disciplined, you know, and mm. to care for someone, you also need to be disciplined. It's fascinating to me, Natasha, that you know, just like the doctor said to me, you know, if you don't lose the weight, you're not going to see your daughter gr graduate. Your friend, when you're 14 years old there in the, in the schoolyard saying, you know, challenging you and, you know, you taking that and moving it to the next level. I, I wonder, I know it's impossible to, to find out, but would you been inspired by something else? I mean, that was a milestone in your life at such a young age. It's remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, I would, yeah. Could you please repeat the question? Because I, yeah, I really didn't have one. I should have had a question there, but I wonder if <laughs> if that didn't happen. <laughs> I was just speaking out loud. If that didn't happen, I wonder if you would, you know, were you already oh. reading the Seven Habits? If that if that didn't happen, would you think you uh -huh. would have done something to make a major shift in your life like that? If he didn't challenge you, mm, I don't. I don't know. It's hard to say. You know, it is hard to say, but I guess since I did have that in me, that desire to challenge the world in some way, I guess I would. Because, you know, <laughs> there was another thing in my life where 
I every single year I was trying to decide what I'm gonna be after school, and at some point I just decided I want to be an actress for many reasons, you know that. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily that were maybe unhealthy at that time because I grew up in a family that mm. didn't give me much attention where I was afraid to express my feelings and I thought that by being an actress I will be able to express myself finally people mm. will accept me as I am and I can process so many emotions of my life and I can be free there where at home if I express myself freely then I get punished for it in some way then in theater I, I could be free and I was um, going for those lessons in theater, for uh, attending lessons for a year. And um, that also something that I think challenged me a lot. And that also required a lot of discipline because everybody was telling me you can't do it because I was a very shy person, uh, not so much into, you know, not not so outgoing, like, a, um, like an actor would be in life, mm. probably actresses and actors they're very you know brave people outgoing extroverts and i was the opposite of that but the reason i wanted to be there is for you know expressing myself and everybody was telling me that you shouldn't do it it's not um you you're not gonna succeed and i guess that impossibility inspired me even more and that's why i tried but at some point, my direction changed and I didn't end up doing theater in the long term. But that was also a period of my life, a couple of years, you know, after I was 14, I like got 16, 17, when I also tried to, again, challenge people around me by working on myself. Hmm. Natasha, what motivates you? Well, it depends <laughs> on what we're talking about. If we're talking about uh, blogging, then what motivates me is um, desire for success. I just see so many successful bloggers that uh, can make a living from doing what they like, from creating. And I think what motivates me is to see my progress slowly. That at first, when I started, it seemed impossible that I will ever succeed because, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of bloggers out there and only 6% will actually make um, enough money of it to survive mm. to you know to have a living or even or i don't know maybe six percent is the very rich ones but basically most people will make some but they won't make so much and at the end your time is not worth it that you invest in it because if you have a day job then you probably make more than with the blog unless you're successful and um i think what inspires me is to see that in spite of um against the odds, I guess, that my blog is still growing, even though there is so much competition. Mm -hmm. My domain authority is not so high, but it is growing and I'm able to monetize it, although it's not so much right now, but it's been less than two years. So my blog is fairly young, but I'm already, you know, able to monetize it in some way. And I think what inspires me with blogging is to see that it's possible. There's so much opportunity and I can be free. I can... Um, be my own boss in a sense and potentially have a job out of this because right now I have a baby and I probably will have a few more but eventually you know they'll go to school and I'll have to have some sort of a job and my dream is to be able to make this my job to make blogging my mm. job and I guess that's what motivates me for the future but what motivates me in life that's the whole different that's the whole different story <laughs> Is it much different? Yeah, I think everything, every little thing is um, has a different motivation. I guess, um, well, it's hard. Like, for example, raising children, what motivates me with my daughter, I guess, is to remember how I grew up and not wanting the same thing mm. for, her, for her and um, mm. hoping that she can have a better future, she can be a, hel a healthier person, you know, emotionally and that um, she can have loving parents and we can impact her life so much because parents play such a huge role in their children's lives. So like that's what motivates me with, let's say, raising children. But there's also something that motivates you to wake up every morning, you know, I guess with this whole war situation, my whole being is a little bit, it feels like it's a little bit threatened that you you don't know what if the war breaks um, 
into our country. We are right next to Ukraine. We're bordering with Ukraine. You know, if it were to go further, then we would be probably the first people that it would touch because we are not only bordering with Ukraine, we're a couple hours away from the border. So you think that um, nothing is 100% guaranteed to you that right now we have a house, we have a family, I have a husband and a daughter, but who knows, you know, if anything were to happen, I might lose everything. And mm. I guess uh, anxiety and like anxiety could take over if I don't um, have, how do you say, like a motivation, an underlying uh, hope or trust. I guess for me, it's my faith. Mm. I'm, I'm, I have a Christian faith and I believe in God. And I guess that's what helps me personally to wake up every morning and to calm my anxiety is that I believe that God, you know, exists and that he's with me and that he is ultimately the source of life and that he will, um, help me no matter what will come and that's what helps me and a lot of times that's what calms my anxiety that what calms my fears and gives me hope for the future and i learned to be thankful that today i have my family today i have my husband today i have my child today i have my house uh, today we have peaceful life and it's not guaranteed to us it's not promised so the, the fact that i have it today i'm thankful and whatever comes tomorrow we'll deal with it tomorrow but i don't want to stress about it today because I don't know when and if even my life will change drastically. Mm. So why suffer about it today? You know, if you don't know what's going to happen, really. Mm, thank you for sharing. That it was wonderful. What a wonderful perspective. How do you measure success, Natasha? <sighs> That's a good question. <laughs> um Again, when it comes to different things, I guess success is different is um, measured differently. So, on one hand, we can say that success is ma is uh, measured by comparing yourself to yourself, like where you are now to where you were before. You can measure it in that way when it comes to your personal, I guess, personal growth. But when it comes to business that's a whole different thing because now you are comparing not yourself to yourself but rather yourself to other competitors out there so i guess when like when we talk about discipline success is are you in the same spot where you were five years ago or are you moving forward um are you improving are you learning something are you moving towards your you know, your goals, your dreams, your hopes, are you working towards it or are you just living, existing and um, kind of letting life happen to you? So I guess success can be measured in how much you change <clears throat> in yourself. And I guess I don't necessarily need to elaborate so much on what is success in <laughs> business or uh, other things that we do in life, because I guess it's obvious that, you know, successful business is the business that is established, makes money from it and i don't know so when it comes to blogging i guess success is when you not only do what you love to do but you also make a living out of it so you not don't have to do it you know when everybody goes to sleep but you can do it during the day when it's your day job and you don't have to work two jobs you know doing your hobby and something else but it became your main source you know basically doing your dream job <laughs> what you like to do Yeah, that, that, that's a wonderful perspective as well. Uh, I Thank you so time, so much for your time today, Natasha. I really enjoyed this. I got excited when you accepted this. We didn't even get into the sugar-free lollies, the bacon grease substitute, just general sh sugar substitutes, buckwheat. You have nine desserts on buckwheat. Those mm -hmm. chocolate chip cookies look amazing. Uh, but the blog is really wonderful. I thank you for your time today. How can we get in touch with you? Um, so... To get in touch with me is probably the best on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, my both Facebook and Instagram are linked on my blog, but um, my Instagram is Natasha's Home. But my Facebook is, I have both. I have Natasha's Home page or my personal page. And my personal page is not linked to anything. So I guess Instagram would be the easiest way. Um, it is Natasha's Home, but this is link, linked on the, on the site. That's the easiest way probably. 
the website Natasha's Home, N A T S H A S O H O M E, Natasha's Home.com. Really, everything starts from there. Natasha, thank you so much for your time. I wish you well. Uh, I hope one day to visit you in, in Hungary and, and have one of those uh, delicious, uh, uh, the, 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 the bread is what's fascinating to me <laughs> with your husband and your and your children. Thank you so much for your time today. You be well. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun to talk to you. Have a great day too. You you be well. Bye now. Das Vidanya. Das Vidanya. Thank you for listening and or viewing Joey Pin's Discipline Conversations. Please share this episode with one or two of your friends who you think may benefit from the episode. Our website, www.joeypins.com. There you find lots of resources and you could join our mailing list. Please follow us on all our social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Podcast information, the video version of our podcast is on YouTube. Please subscribe. Audio is on all major podcasting platforms. Please follow them. And if you like it, please consider giving five-star rating. Would really appreciate that. Would you like to financially support the podcast? You can go to our Patreon site. Consider $5, $10, or $20 a month. There's all kind of plans that we have there. There's like a one-time payment. What is this podcast episode worth to you? $25, $50, $100, $500, $1,000, $5,000. You be the judge. You can go to our PayPal account to do that as well. Thank you again for listening or watching Joey Pinn's Discipline Conversations.